Welcome to another Zoom. We are coming to you from, is it California? No, it's actually Franklin, Tennessee. I've moved. (laughs) I love it. I love you got out of California. This guy right here is so brilliant, and he is the author of this latest book. It is called The American Covenant. We're going to find out why the name Covenant is so important. But this is Marshall Foster. He's founder and president of the World History Institute. Tell me about that. Well, we started it, uh, sir, about uh, 45 years ago, uh, in in 1976. I had been involved in the Jesus movement. I was with Campus Crusade, and I was on the college campus for nine years fighting the Marxists. And I realized we were losing America to this worldview. And so I started an organization, which is now called the World History Institute, that teaches the history of the world from a Christian perspective, and specifically we hone in on the history of America. And we've been giving seminars or 450 seminars over four decades. And we've done movies with Kirk Cameron, one called Monumental, which we did in 2012, which uh, made the theaters and we're doing more things. And now we have a whole new strategy that's been unleashed called the American Campfire Revival, which is built around my new book, The American Covenant. And Kirk Cameron is teaching it uh, again this fall for a hundred days in a row. Explain, uh, who, he, explain who he is. Kirk Cameron, the actor from uh, Growing Pains back in the 80s, was a famous actor then, and he's become a, a, an icon of the Christian community, sharing the gospel of Christ, being a faithful witness with he and his six children and his wonderful wife. Wow. And uh, live right six close to where children? I live. And, yeah, he has six, uh, four of them adopted. And uh, he just, uh, he, incredible, he was with me yesterday. He was with us for four days here in Franklin, Tennessee. And we were live. They can go right on to a, this live Facebook and see it from Saturday night on September 11. Kirk and I were on at my son's farm here in Tennessee. And we had a campfire and went to the whole nation on Facebook um, called the American Campfire Revival, where we talked about 9-11 and we talked about the strategy to get us out of this terrible fix we're in now as a country. So that's what we're doing. But anyway, that's a quick a quick story. Yeah, you, you are an amazing author because your books are actually like encyclopedias you can really you refer back to them or if you're talking to somebody and they most people would say are you sure about that just grab this book and go right back to it so it's 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 an amazing gift that you have well thank you we we try to communicate basically with the people in the in the fundamentals that we need not just the externals not just the issues of the day but let's go back to the fundamental principles of scripture right and history and say what made us great what has happened to our public school system our colleges i mean they have if they were to read this book if you forced them to and say okay do you have any questions they would say i don't believe a word i just read because i've never heard that before Well, that's right. It's because the Christian history of America and really just the true history of America has been whitewashed from America's college campuses over a process of about 70 years. And it's it's it took place exactly 1924. Frankfurt Institute in Germany moved over to Columbia Teachers College. John Dewey got involved. John Dewey, the founding father of progressive public education. They moved in and rewrote American history textbooks so that with men like Charles Beard and his wife, so that by 1950, all the textbooks of America were relating a new view that took out the Christian history, the pilgrims, the character, the foundations of America being in the Bible, and uh, and that our republic is a one-of-a-kind republic built upon Christian principles. That has been completely taken away from two generations, at least, almost three generations now of Americans don't know that story, brother. And that's what that's what's so sad, and that's why... We've been losing the battle. Marshall, how did we allow this to happen? Were we sleeping like Roe v. Wade? I mean, we're totally uh, unconscious when all of this is taking place. And all of a sudden we wake up one day and go, how did that happen? Especially with our textbooks. Well, right. I think part of it was that the church had been in a long decline of what I call pietism, where we had separated the faith into a spiritual part of life and a physical part of life. And and most most evangelicals or Bible believing Christians tended to say, "I don't want to drink 
smoke and chew and go with girls to do. And I don't want to be involved in that wicked culture. So we'll set up our own culture. And we had a like a subculture that we set up. We used to be the culture. All the all the headmasters of every Christian call, every college in America were actually pastors until until 1885. Uh, America's colleges were set up as Christian schools, all of them. Uh, America was a Christian nation, bar none in the history of the world in the 19th century. It's only in the 20th century that we let go of the major controls of all the institutions. That wasn't done because some Marxist forced us to. It was done because we as Christians withdrew our cultural commission or our our, our understanding of what we're to do in this world. We're not only to evangelize, but we are also to, to occupy until he comes. We are to be here involved in every institution to make sure this doesn't happen. Was we it that go of education? Was it the right. Democrats, the political party of the hierarchy and the Democrats, or were the Republicans also part of this letting go and let, uh, let things happen other than what happened in the 19th century? Yeah, it's a national, it's a national cabal that is that is grown up in the 20th century that involves both parties, actually, uh, because we were sold uh, the same people that are in politics today, regardless of party. The Democrats are much worse when it comes to their wanting to literally rewrite and put CRT, you know, critical race theory and all that right in the center focus yeah, of the, America. The Democrats are a total whack job. Total, total gone. But the, but the Republicans have been part of it because we got they were involved in this. You know, they most of them went to progressive public schools. Most of them then would go along with the idea of I'll give to my alma mater, Texas A&M or wherever I went to school. Prince I'll give money Columbia, to them. Yeah. I like football. And so generally public schools are good. Right. Uh, no, public schools are not good. What has happened to them is so diabolical that uh, Christian children should not be there. And we should be doing everything we can to. Uh, to defund them. This is an excerpt from your book. I mean, your book is great. I mean, you just, you, you put facts in there, but, but they're readable. And, 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 and you understand them as soon as you read them. Here, here's one. You, you say, we were told the American experience was just a chance accumulation of men who wanted uh, prosperity. In other words, if you, if you want to, uh, allow the public out there when they pick up your information, all they have to do is hear something bad about you, the author, and make up something about your past and bring that on to the networks. And they go, oh, Marshall, Fa oh, my goodness, I don't want to read that book. So what they've done, and they're doing it every day, That's is they sure. destroy the person that brings to light what is actually happening in America and they ruin their reputation and therefore they're no authority about anything. It's called cancel culture. And that what they do is they simply cancel you. This is what happens in Russia. That all began in the Russian revolution with uh, men like Gramsci and others. Uh, and uh, Trotsky, for example, was one, was the second leader of the Russian revolution. Trotsky got on the outside and as a result, uh, he was kicked out and they took him out of the books like he didn't exist. And so in Russia, they were taught that there was no man who ever existed by the name of Trotsky. Yeah. And uh, literally they had him killed in Mexico, you know, 10 years later when he was hiding. But the point is, they just simply took him out of the textbooks. The way that, the way in which the socialists work on the campus is they simply do away with their enemies. Back in the 60s, I used to be able to go on the free speech platform and debate these guys because we used to have free speech platforms. America's universities don't have free speech platforms anymore. If you go on there as a conservative and begin to speak anywhere on the campus, they'll say it's illegal. You can't do that. Why are you doing? You're in a you're in a public place. You well, can't you say those you things. probably will be killed. Yeah, well, you'd be you'd be definitely harassed off the campus and the campus police will escort you out. Because there is no such thing as free speech anymore on America's public or mostly private universities. That's the sad reality is that we're not facing the facts. Let's all debate the issues and let's do it in open. Right. But right. let's don't play the game that it's it's your way, or the highway. The leader of the Communist Party back about 40 years ago during the revolution was, was a man named Herbert Marcuse. He was 82 years old. He was a professor at the University of San Diego and the head of the Communist Party at the time. He said, we believe in selective tolerance. Selective tolerance means we, those that agree with us, 
then we give them favors. Those that disagree with, we do away with. So that's what he means by selective tolerance. He tolerates how long ago, all those how long ago did this guy talk that? How well, he, he said that during this during the sixties revolution. He was the man behind the riots and revolutions on the college campuses that were going on at Berkeley and all over the country back in the sixties and seventies. That was Herbert Marcuse, and that was the they were wiling it up because they saw they could reach a generation of youth with this idea of rebellion and and they said, while they're laying in their beds late at night with their sex, drugs, and rock and roll, we'll slit their throats. You know, it's they knew what they were doing. They were out to destroy America's youth and develop a revolution in America, which is the Marxist way. Marshall, are we in a situation right now that America cannot be retrieved as we know it? No, no, I think it can be. Uh, very much so. Uh I think what we're doing is going through something that God has brought on us, not what the Marxists have done. I don't I don't even spend my time worrying about what the Marxists are doing at this point. I believe what is needed is to is to be concerned about where what is the body of Christ doing? What are the Christians doing? What are the believers doing? Because in reality, there have been revivals at least every 50 years in America. Four great awakenings were due for another one. And what God is doing is he is he is letting us go into deeper, deeper problems because we have not yet repented. We have not yet come back and restored and rebuilt. And it begins with the church and it begins specifically in my own heart. And so, so what we've done with, with, uh, with the American Campfire Revival, with Kirk Cameron and with my book, The American Covenant, is that, is that, and we're just a little part of this strategy. Obviously, God's doing it in many ways, but we're going back to the local. That's how America was built. And what we need is a local revival. In the, in the homes where we learn these principles and we learn the scripture again of how America was built. What is a constitution? What does the constitution say we can and cannot do? How does that relate to us today? How can we deal with education and economics and government? And all these things need to be dealt with in a biblical manner. And that needs to be done at the local level around campfires in studies uh, by Americans of all kinds in all states. It begins in the heart and goes out to the nation. Doesn't begin in the White House. It begins in our house. Wow. So we're starting a strategy of revival that begins there, and uh, that's you, the way awakenings have always happened. Do you see it? It's happening. Hold, oh, is oh, it happening? Oh, oh, it's happening. Kirk has three and a half million people just watching those nightly programs he's been doing, and the result of that is that we're having campfires this fall around the East Coast and all the way to the West starting at Plymouth, Massachusetts on October 3rd, the great celebration of the pilgrims coming to America at the Forefathers Monument, the great monument that we talk about in the movie Monumental. We're going to be there with a campfire uh, starting at 4.30 in the afternoon on October 3rd. And that's going to have thousands of people. We're going to be rejoicing on the heritage of our fathers and restoring ourselves to and reviving the covenant that, that America made with God. From that point, we're going to hold them in North Carolina at Billy Graham's original home, which now is, a, is has become a national shrine, a monument that's been bought as a nonprofit. We're going to be having a fire there. We're going to be having a fire in, in Tennessee right here outside of Franklin with five or 10,000 people. We're having these campfires all during October around in Texas and North Carolina and Tennessee and all around. Anyway, they can see that on uh, KirkCameron.com. Uh, go to go to worldhistoryinstitute.com and you can get your copy of the American Covenant uh, and and b just begin to follow us, what we're doing, because we just want to grassroots, allow the people to educate themselves. We don't believe in that top down anything and we don't believe in a riot or a revolution. That's not the way to save our country is to play like we're going to be tough guys and bring on a civil war. We don't need a civil war. What we need is for us, the body of Christ, to get right with God. And then we can become the, the, the army of compassion that can unite our nation peacefully. There's no doubt in my mind, brother, we can do it. And I think we can see that happen all in a decade. It, it sounds like the old time Great Awakening. That's right. That's because right. think about it. When they started, there was no chance that that would spread even, even, to, even to England and to Scotland. Yeah. Yeah, all over the place. And it and it usually begins with one or two individuals and it begins at the grassroots and usually the establishment is against it. Does that sound familiar? Me meaning the churches? The yeah, many of the churches even uh, in those days didn't like George Whitfield when he went up the coast in the 1730s 
a lot of the churches wouldn't let him in. So he went on the hillsides and he preached the gospel to tw- crowds of 20,000 people on a hillside. Uh, and he, half, of the, half of the South was converted and one third of the North was converted over a 30 year period, which set the stage for the American Revolution and our liberty, all based on an awakening. So what we need is a spiritual awakening and, and that, that results in a cultural awakening. And the two go hand in hand. Does that make sense? We, we, we have somehow walked into the idea that the bigger the church, the more people that you can seat in that church is the way to go. And apparently that has not worked. No, no. Uh, yeah, no, that doesn't work. This, the size of your church isn't what counts. It is, it is that, we, that we are locally living out the gospel there were no churches in the New Testament for the first 300 years. There was never a church building built. Uh, and yet they, oh, they took down the Roman Empire. How did they do it in 300 years? They did it from the grassroots out of catacombs. And they did it by caring for the unborn babies that were going to be killed by the wolves as everybody threw their babies out the front door. If they didn't want them or, the, or, the, or the, during the plagues, they throw their mothers when they got sick out in the streets. And the, the Christians would come out of the catacombs and pick them up and nurse the plague victims and get the plague themselves. And because of their love and self-sacrifice, the Roman people turned to Christ instead of turning to the pagan gods. What's going to happen in America, I believe, brother, is a turning from the pagan gods of materialism and Marxism that are dominating our country, turning back to the God of the Bible when they see the love and the compassion and the intellectual integrity of the people that are believers saying, let's come back to the truth. Foster, this world is not our home, right? It's not our permanent home, yeah. but it is our temporal abode where we need to make it as, as godly as possible. In other words, we need to we need to bring the gospel to bear uh, so that so that it becomes a better place. Do you believe we will see suffering in America for Christians? Oh, we're already seeing that, and I think that, will, that about, will probably increase. I'm not talking about somebody cussing you out. I'm no, talking no, about no, suffering. we're talking about persecution. Yeah, yeah, like martyrdom. Oh, I think that may happen. It doesn't have to happen, though. We don't have to go that far. And it is happening with many Christ- Christians over there in the Middle East right now, and in China. Of course, they're already going through it. My prayer is that we will not let it go that far uh, in our watch and that God will grant us a great awakening so that America can become a city on a hill again, so that we can relieve the suffering of those that are dying under under communism right now. What, what, what do you envision? I mean, obviously the campfire idea. How many, you say 20,000? Well, the, the goal is to have... Uh, a thousand campfire leaders. We have a whole video series that Kirk and I have put together. That's a 10 part series and it'll be coming out here in October. And it's so that a leader will be able to watch us for 20 minutes and then have the book and have their Bibles and do their own study with their own local people. And so uh, on a local basis, they can begin to have a campfire of their own. That's already beginning up. We had the first one here in Tennessee on Saturday. Uh, And we're looking for a thousand campfire leaders to have a have a thousand campfire uh, 10 week sessions in every county in America. That would be a million campfire revival study groups. And we put 10 people in a study group. That's 10 million people studying together this fall. That's our goal. So that they can learn these principles themselves and then begin to trust God for great and mighty things. Reaching well, what, out are they, what do they do after that? Do they go out into the community to spread this message? Absolutely. They start their own camper. They teach their own kids. And the idea is that we will then have them deal at the end of every session with the issues of our day from a biblical point of view. But you've got to begin with the basic principles. You've got to begin with the basic history and the basic scripture. Start with the basics and learn the basics of how to reason and think for ourselves and go through the original source documents of history ourselves. Then we can reason to the issues. So that if it's welfare, is it, is it national spending, deficit spending? Is it going to be in, uh, uh, immigration or international affairs? Whatever the issue is, there's a biblical solution to that problem. You, and you that's cover, where, yeah. You cover in your, in your book, and, and what, what I'm applying or referring to is everything that I'm saying is out of your book so that people viewing will yeah. understand they can get the whole story because your book is so well written, but you talk about defining the providential view. Calvin shaped our republic. Yes. yes. I mean, 
when I read that, I, I, I did not realize the influence that he had. And actually, he was in Switzerland, wasn't he? He was in Switzerland in the 16th century. He was one of the first forerunners, along with Martin Luther, to bring people back to the Bible. And basically, he just taught that God was sovereign, the state or the pope was not. And so this was revolutionary to the people of Europe because they had been taught that you always bow behind this hierarchy. And he's come along and said, wait a minute, God is sovereign over every institution. And so Calvin's influence on American founding fathers was fundamental. All of them understood that, wait a minute, the state is not God. God is God. And that's why in our Declaration of Independence, we said all men are created equal by God and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, not by the government. And that was revolutionary in the, in the history of, of men. Uh, in the history of nations, and that's because they went back to these fundamental principles of the Reformation taught by people like like uh, John Calvin. You talk about the dominion mandate. What is that all about? The cultural mandate, or the dominion mandate, is the mandate, the first words ever spoken by God to man were in Genesis chapter 1, 28 to 20, to, to 20. and in there, God says, Go out, Adam. This is what I want you to do. I, I created you for this purpose. You and Eve are created to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and to replenish it and to, and, to, and, to, and, to, and to make it glorify me, to make it a better place, not just a wilderness, but to make it a better place. Found cities, found things, have children, multiply, fill the earth. And that was our commission. It was repeated again to Noah after the flood. The first words from God were, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And after that, it was given in the great commission of our Lord, go and disciple the nations, teaching the nations to obey all that I have commanded you. So the commission of the cultural commission is tied to the great commission of our Lord, which was given there in the great commission to the, to the disciples. And the two fit hand in glove because then we are to go out in the name of God and to be his ambassadors and to bring his glory and his relevance to every issue of life. And that's what we do. When we do it, people are free and the nations rejoice. When we don't do it, uh, the people live in fear and tyrants take over. You talk about the pilgrim body politic. Uh, uh, Pastor Robinson wrote, uh, you, you cover his life in yeah, the book. Robinson. I think this is the latter chapters. But what, what are you talking about? You talk about the pilgrim body politic. Well, they actually founded our nation with the Mayflower Compact in, uh, on November 11th of, of 1620, 401 years ago exactly. And it was that, that document was the foundation of a covenantal view of government. That's why we use the American Covenant. We were founded as a covenant, and they went back to the covenants of Moses. In fact, they'd studied under the Hebrew scholars in Leiden where they were. And from there, they learned that Moses didn't set up a a uh, hierarchy or a monarchy. He set up a republic in the wilderness in which God was king, but there was no king among the people. They were elected representatives. And in essence, they went down to the local tribal area and Moses was told to break up the authority and to elect judges at the common level based on their character. And this development of a local self-governing republic, uh, including the Senate, the House, a judiciary, was all part of Moses' plan. And that was 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 not developed fully because of all the sin and debauchery until the founding of America under the pilgrims. Does, Greatest nation the world's ever known. Does our government know that our whole government system was put together from this, the Bible? Oh, they, there's not one politician in a thousand that knows that. Then that is that is one of the great missing links to the revival. We must understand that. When Stephen Langton, who was the, who was the headmaster or the, or the president of Harvard, was asked in 1788 to give a sermon to the legislature of, the, of New Hampshire, they were facing whether or not to okay the, the Constitutional Convention. And you see that in the end of my book and in a whole appendix on it. And in there, what did he choose to say to the legislature to convince them to sign on with the, with the Constitution? Because if they didn't sign on, there would be no constitution because they were the ninth state and they needed the ninth state. But sure enough, what did they do? They 
listen to his words. And he went through it. He said, he said, Moses gave us down from the mountain. He gave us a constitutional republic. Ours is a republic. Let's let's follow Moses and what the scripture says. And let's go with the Constitution. They voted for it. We have a Constitution today. Let me tell you, our founders knew the Bible was the foundation. Well, the Word of God is printed on the buildings, the, the monuments. Uh, it's everywhere. In, in, in Congress, behind where the president gives his state to of God, we trust. It is. Yeah. So, so how do they walk in? I mean, these atheist politicians that, not, that have never prayed and act like they know as much about God as anybody. And how do they see that and not try to figure out why is that printed like that? How long has that been there? Many of them would, would, would give anything if they could whitewash those sandstones, if they could get rid of those monuments. And in fact, is that already begun in our country? Are we already beginning to lose monuments of yes. uh, George Washington? And you know, yes. it's going to be, it's just a step at a time to do away with the name of God. And that's why the person the persecution of the church could be just around the corner if we don't restore our constitutional republic and remember our First Amendment rights, which come out of the Bill of Rights, etc. And it's just a matter of us waking up. We have a few seconds left. Share Christ with somebody that is watching right now. Wow. Well, I would just encourage your audience and individuals in the audience who are saying this is something new is to just just to look back to the Bible and look what the word of God says. The, it's true, but it's not this is not just about America, or about politics. It's about you. It's about your life. It's about God loving you so much that he sent his own son to die for you. And all of this reformation, all of this talk about making the world a better place starts with you and me repenting of our sin turning to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us and say, Lord, I accept the forgiveness that you have given me. And I turn from my wicked ways. I turn to you, please forgive me and make me a new person. And what he'll do, if you'll do that today, he will make you a new person from the inside out and you will become a blessing to the world rather than a curse. Do it today. Look in the scripture, read the book of John and you will find Christ. Marshall Foster, thank you for writing this. Hope to have you back again. Will you do that for us? I love being with you anytime. Jesus Christ is the answer to every need you may have. Great book, but this is the greatest book you'll ever read, at least two chapters today. We want you that are watching. When you tune into a program like this, maybe you don't understand why you're watching. But guess what? Now we know to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. God bless you. Bye-bye.